I've enjoyed everything that I've heard and everyone that I've met on this visit. I consider it a distinct honor to be invited here. Let me enlarge, if I may, the frame of reference. We've heard a great deal, I've heard a great deal about the South. The South is an integral part of our civilization. And essentially, our civilization used to be known as Christendom. And every section, we are a part of Christendom, we are a part of the European civilization. And the European civilization today is deeply concerned about the inrush of millions of people from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East in Europe, and Latin America as well here. And the massive migration of millions of people <clears throat> is not particularly new. It's happened before. It's very seldom really deeply discussed because it's an emotional issue. And the only previous civilization that we know in any depth and in any detail is the Greco-Roman civilization. And we know, for instance, that Rome expanded by military means, by conquest and it inevitably gathered as it conquered an increasing number of other people. And these were very diverse, various tribes who had come down from somewhere in the northern reaches, we don't know, we don't know where, into what today we call Europe. And in the beginning, these conquests were a great advantage to the Romans. In fact, they were such an advantage that the Romans didn't have to pay any taxes at, at all. They were able to live on the riches of the people that they conquered and on the benefits from their labor under their rule. But that, of course, could not continue forever. There was a limit to how far the Roman army could expand. And eventually the conquest came to an end and they said, well, we've got all the territory that we could possibly manage to govern. And from then on, they began to run into trouble because Rome was a military system. It was a military government. It was not really an economic system. And it had, in order to govern the empire, to maintain a large army and a large number of bureaucrats. The last expansion of the Romans was to expand into what we today call, or what they then called, Britain. And they conquered, as we know, all of modern England up to the edge of Scotland where they decided it was the better part of wisdom to stop. <laughs> then they had several hundred years to govern all these diverse people. And inevitably, they did not produce enough children to maintain, to keep the army supplied with Romans. And as they got older and richer as a civilization, the men no longer wanted to serve in the army or take the risks of battle. The birth rate declined, as it always declines when you live in cities. And the number of foreigners and descendants of the immigrants, you might say, in the empire increased to the point where Eventually, the army became mainly dominated by pagans and descendants of pagan immigrants. In order to make this acceptable, the Romans then expanded their citizenship 
instead of just Romans being citizens, then everybody in the empire became citizens. And that led to an increasing number of religious groups being recognized. So they set up what they called the Pantheon, in which all the different gods that were worshipped by the people inside the emperor, empire were officially recognized. And they call that polytheism. All these religions were equal so long as all of them obeyed the government. That's the system that we have today in the United States. We are officially told by our universities and by our government and by our courts that this is not a Christian country, that this is a country where all religions are equal and no religion is supposed to get a special privilege. And by the way, on the question of the establishment of religion, our our constitutional writers made a semantic error. They should have said the, we should not have an established church, but they said established religion. The real established, established religion is a religion, a friend of mine said, about which, which we cannot openly criticize. Now, there's no real reason, however, to dwell on the problems of the Romans, excepting as an example to those of us today, to see what actually happened in the past is to, under, to a great civilization, and one that lasted for almost 500 years, is to find many examples that we might today consider in the reorganization of the American government, which is the unstated but nevertheless basic topic which we have been hearing for the last day and a half. Once the un-Romans, you might say, once the foreigners began to take over the culture of Rome, the Roman people themselves began to diminish in numbers most of their literature, it's interesting, under the Caesars, always dwelled on the days of the Republic. They didn't talk about what was going on under the Caesars because the Caesars were all despots. And you couldn't speak openly against the government. Tacitus, the Roman historian, said, <coughs> talking about the days of Tiberius, you are sitting in the arena waiting for the games to begin, and a stranger comes and sits beside you and begins to criticize the government. You agree, and he puts you under arrest. There's nothing new. In time, the level of literacy and the level of skill began to diminish in the Roman Empire because the government began to run out of money. It debased the currency and they had inflation which made matters worse because inflation brings shortages. It isn't worthwhile for merchants and farmers to sell their produce when the money isn't of any value. So you get shortages and in time they reached the level of decay where the whole empire was living on rations, especially in Italy itself. They had a different amount of food for a full-bodied man, less for his wife, less for the children, less for the elderly. And the army was almost all barbarian. The emperors were no longer Italian. They came from other parts. The level of literacy fell as the number of well-to-do people declined, so they couldn't afford to hire teachers. So children grew up and adults appeared who had a very poor grasp of reading and writing. And that meant that you couldn't administer the government very well. So the whole system began to decay from within. And the Christians who kept their own culture alive within as a minority became gradually the most educated minority in the empire. 
and eventually took it over, took over the administration entirely after Constantine. The, but as Christianity rose, the Roman civilization went down. We entered what was called the, the Christian era. Now, the Christians had a big problem because they were surrounded by pagans whom they had to either convert or overcome, either conquer or be conquered. The Old Testament saved Christianity. The Old Testament said, fight for your faith. And it was the operation of the Old Testament which enabled the proponents of the New Testament who talked about on a higher level to survive, took the two branches of the faith to accomplish this, and it took until the year 1000 A.D. to to Christianize Europe. The last to convert were the Scandinavians in the year 1000. And between what year 1000 and 1200, all the great cathedrals were created. Everyone, practically everyone. The Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris was built by voluntary labor when there were only 150,000 people in Paris. And of course, we had all the, the rise of all these diverse countries in Europe. France, Holland, Britain, Belgium, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia. They all thought they were different, but they were all united by one faith, the one and the many. Something like ancient Greece, which had Greek city-states, which even had wars with one another, but were all Greek. And up until the Peloponnesian War, they all spoke the same language and understood and worshipped the same gods. We had, in Christendom, created a highest civilization in the history of the world, the most diverse and yet at the same time the most united. But when we look, and we we look at the, the rise, by 1900, for instance, the United States had become the richest country in the world. Those who flew through Ellis Island and who tell us all about it in the years from 1890 to 1910 came to the richest country in the world. These cities and the territories had already been conquered. The plains had been settled. The great industries had been created. They came to help themselves, not to help us, because we didn't need any help by 1900. That was unprecedented. The speed of our rise was unprecedented, but we had all this territory to fill, and we brought in people from all over Europe in order to help us fill it, in order to build the roads and the factories and to settle the land and to conquer it, because don't forget, the Indian Wars continued all the way up to the 1870s and 80s. It took a long time to conquer the Indians. People dismiss that effort today as being relatively minor, but it wasn't. They outnumbered us a lot when we arrived, and they were very warlike and uh, very, very difficult to overcome. In 1921, however, the influx of people into the United States began to frighten everybody. We had too many great teeming masses in New York, speaking different languages. There was a period in the latter part of the 19th century when they spoke German in part of Texas to such an extent that even the court trials were in German. And German wasn't the only foreign language that you heard. Foreign newspapers all over the place. It took quite a while to Americanize, so to speak, even the European people who came here. So by 1921, they felt we better close the gates, or at least we ought to control this. And they set up an immigration law in which the people from every part of Europe 
were limited to the proportion of those of their predecessors who had already arrived. And an overall overall limit was put on the numbers from each country and it was to be proportionate so that the basic culture and ethnic character of the United States would not be disturbed. It would be maintained. And it was a very fair-minded, very fair-minded act. And the immigration began to slow down. And in the 30s, when we ran into a depression, there was actually an outflow of people who left the country altogether and went back to where they came from because they didn't want to be in a country where it was that tough to get a job. But by the 30s, we not only had a depression, but all Christendom fell into a great catastrophe. I've already mentioned how rich we were by 1900. That was true of Europe also. Europe and the United States, which I always consider a part of Europe, was enormously rich and fell into the same mistake that the Greeks had fallen into when their city-states became very large and rich and powerful. It fell into a fratricidal war, World War I. Now, the Greeks did this. The Greeks fell into a war between their two leading powers, between Sparta and Athens. And it lasted 30 years, a 30 years war. And in those days, wars were hand to hand. It was a very bloody, terrible war. In the middle of the war, a plague came along to make matters even worse. And by the time the two sides got together to negotiate a peace, their respective languages had changed so much in a single generation that they had difficulty talking to each other. And the historians believe that ancient Greece was destroyed, basically, by the Peloponnesian War. It broke the spine of that civilization that never recovered. World War I the historians believe, did the same thing to Christendom. In the first place, the faith had already declined to such an extent that the leaders of England and France and Germany were perfectly willing to send millions of men to certain death when the goal of the war was very difficult to define. By 1915, they would have settled but a German victory if we had not intervened via Woodrow Wilson to extend the war. And it extended, as we know, into a virtual suicide of the West. Practically destroyed an entire generation of men, the flower of their country. And there is some question as to whether the West will recover or whether World War I would create such a havoc, such destruction, as to equal, equal the failure of the Greeks to maintain what they had. In World War, by the end of that war, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had been broken apart after 500 years. The Russian Empire had collapsed and was taken over by a band of atheists who outlawed God in that country. And the devastation had reduced the English to near destitution. They came out with officially more, more uh, property, more territory, but actually greatly weakened. And it's very interesting that no statesman or politician ever again spoke of Christendom. The only exception was Winston Churchill. After World War I, Christianity dropped out of the conversation of our governments. And we had already, both here and across the continent, removed the clergy from the heads of our universities, from the head of Harvard and Yale and Princeton, not Princeton, Princeton came a little later, 
but Harvard, Yale, and many other colleges. In England, Oxford, and Cambridge lost clergymen at the head. The Christian faith faded from the top levels of Europe and the United States in the period from 1870, let's say, to 1918. And, of course, the conduct of the war broke all civilized restraints. What's even worse was that in 1939, the whole thing began again. We could say that in the 30s, the fact that the faith had declined overall was proven by the rise of socialism. Socialism is what the Bolsheviks called the system in the USSR. It was the United Soviet Socialist Republics. Hitler was a national socialist. So was Mussolini. So were the countries of the Balkans, the new countries of the Balkans, some of which had been raised from the grave, like Poland, which hadn't existed for 150 years, Hungary as an independent country, and so forth. We had a fragmented, a fragmented situation by 1939, which was made worse by World War II, the greatest conflagration imaginable. 35 million dead, directly. And more than that, whose lives were irretrievably shattered. And after World War II, Mr. Wilson's idea of self-determination of nations led both the United States and the USSR to collaborate to bring down our Western allies to destroy the colonial system that they had established over a period of 400 years. England was told that it should get out of India. France was told that it should get out of Indochina. Belgium, Holland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, were all told to get rid of their colonies because those people had a right to determine their own destiny and govern themselves. The white people of the West were told that it was unjust for them to rule over the colored races in the rest of the world. That was the basic premise of the argument. England was literally talked and forced by lack of money, lack of the ability to maintain the army and the navy. France, all the Western allies were told that they didn't need worldwide armies and navies and air forces anymore. The United States would militarily protect them all. We would undertake to be their army and their navy and their air force. So the colonial world, the colonial world was taken out of the out of the hands of the Christian West, or the ex-Christian West, however you want to put it. And look at it. Look at it. With the withdrawal of the Christian West, these peoples began to kill each other as they had before we arrived, before the Europeans arrived. We had the massacres in Rwanda, which occurred, by the way, 25 years ago to the same extent that they have recently. We had massacres in Liberia and Ethiopia and Zambia and Zaire and in Mozambique and in all the other countries which are now have a representation in the UN and which are operated by cannibals and savages of the most utterly degraded sort. This is the post-war world we know today. Now, we've already talked about these two world wars as repeating the eras of the Greeks. The two world wars have demolished or broken the spine of the Western civilization just as definitely as the Greeks broke theirs in the Peloponnesian War. But to add to that era, we've added the era of the Romans in that we have opened our gates to the influx of any group of people anywhere in the world to come walking in 
and settling down wherever they choose in our midst. By the millions, nobody knows how many. And that began in 1965, 25 years ago. We had heard a great deal of complaint from our illiberal minorities about the injustice of the 1921 Immigration Act. So they enacted in the middle of the night, because I didn't even read about it when it was enacted, they enacted a, what they called an Immigration Reform Act in which the quotas which restricted the Orientals and the blacks and other races from coming in were eliminated. And a new ceiling was created for legal immigrants and their families. And that little phrase, which was added in at the last minute without any announcement to anybody else, meant have you ever tried to figure out the family names of an Oriental family? Have you ever tried to trace the genealogy of an African family? I mean, they, they, they never stop. They call everyone else in the tribe a brother and a sister. They're all related. They consider the whole tribe one family. And the tribes consist of millions of people. There are 450 million black Africans, and they're all related. I don't know what we're going to do with them all. And then suddenly the influx began. And as the word went around the world that the United States was up for grabs and open to everybody, the numbers increased and increased and increased and have continued to increase until we are now confronted with the greatest migration of people since the ancient world, the greatest migration of peoples for 2,500 years is recurring. And it's not simply recurring to us. It's recurring to Europe as well because when Europe lost control of its colonies, the colonies not having risen yet to the level of civilization where they could properly govern themselves, which could have been achieved if they'd been left in place, these people began to lose their homes and tribal wars, their jobs, their factories, even their hospitals, because in some areas they drove out the doctors and the nurses and the missionaries because they didn't want any more white people at all, so the hospitals collapsed disease began to spread and they began to run for their lives into Europe. In Italy has about two and a half million. Spain has at least that many black Africans, all illegal. Germany has the Turks. France has the Algerians. When Idi Amin ordered all the Hindus out of Zambia, I'm not sure that's the right country, Ghana, I think it is, Ghana. First he seized all their property, and then he told them to get out of the country or he would have them killed. And technically they had English passports from the days when Ghana was an English possession. They appealed to India to allow them to come back to India, and India refused. It didn't want any Indians coming back that didn't have any money. So the sentimental English decided to accept them. So they got a flood, not simply from Ghana, but from other parts of black Africa, because they had originally brought them in there to work anyway. And one of the problems now is that England has a Asian parliament, a Hindu parliament, which the Hindus have set up, which is making laws only for the Hindu community in the middle of England. And they're arguing in the public schools of England, or the private, uh, the government schools, that their religion should be taught together with the Christian religion in England, because England is still technically an English country, and the law there demands that they have at least one hour of instruction in Christianity every day. Well, the Hindus say, we want an hour in the Hindu religions. And Hindu religions, as you know, is a very elaborate one. 
And they also have, of course, black Jamaicans who have introduced them to mugging. <laughs> and to burning down their houses. I had an Englishman tell me we had immigrants before, and they were poor before. We never had any poor immigrants who burned down their own houses before. <laughs> but the greatest upheaval is coming from the Third World and from the Orient. Even Russia is running into this. Although the white Russians are fleeing into Eastern Europe on the west side, or on the eastern side of Russia, they have, in the last decade alone, almost 30 million Chinese who are pouring in to the unguarded areas of Russia. And you know it was said, I don't know if it was true or not, that when Dung, the leader of the Chinese, was over here, a very well-named man. <laughs> but President Carter said something about we could accept more people from China, and Dung said we can send you 50 million if you'd like. <laughs> now, this is a tremendous problem, because Europe is facing the Roman mistake having opened its gates to the world and the world is very large it isn't one world it's a very very large multiple multiple world it's an enormous world with enormous numbers of people pouring into Europe from one end to the other and pouring into us from one end to the other And many of these people are very uh, uh, indignant at the idea that the gate should ever be closed. Our alien problem is actually larger than Europe because the Europeans never made the mistake of saying everybody is welcome. Today, we legally accept more immigrants than all the rest of the governments of the world combined about a million a year. Well, in 20 years, that means 20 million, plus their children. In the meantime, we've aborted 35 million of our own. And that's what's upset the Social Security balance. They're saying that there won't be enough young people to take care of the elderly in another generation. Well, if you kill the young, how could you possibly have enough to take care of the elderly? you imagine what 35 million new citizens born and raised here in the United States and their children now would mean to the population mix of this country? So, in looking at the background of this calamity, which is about what it is, we find that it was Senator Ted Kennedy that slipped in the word about the relatives. And in the meantime, we couldn't get some friends of mine and I wanted to bring a young man from Scotland over here to attend a seminary just on a student permit. And it took us 18 months because there's no room for white immigrants in the present operation of our immigration laws. 10% of whites are allowed to immigrant. 90% are black Oriental or Latin. That's legally. Illegally. It's anybody that has the energy to walk across the border. And many come in on planes just as passengers, as travelers, get off the plane and disappear into the crowd. Nobody knows who they are or where they are. It's not very hard to get uh, a Social Security card and the rest of the whatever you need to get along. We have the Border Patrol is undermanned. It arrested 1.8 million illegals in 1985. That was 10 years ago. The situation wasn't so bad then. 1.8 million arrested. And they estimated that five times that number escaped a detection. 
We also did something very brilliant under Senator Alan Simpson and some others. We delivered an amnesty a few years back to all the illegals that had been here for a certain length of time. And that, of course, got more coming running because if that's the way we're going to do it, they know they'll be forgiven and they can stay as long as they like. Senator Simpson, joined by Jack Kemp, Newt Gingrich, Bob Dornan, and John McCain, said the amnesty was a good thing, would solve the problem because they said it would be insupportable to have a witch hunt or an alien hunt throughout the country in order to find out who is here illegally and who isn't. These are the conservative leaders. They made two and a half million aliens instantly legal under those provisions. And in the meantime, the Congress refused, it said it was going to in, increase the Border Patrol. It refused to appropriate the money. So our population has grown in 25 years from 179 million in 1960, now that's 35 years, to 257 million in 1993. We're increasing at the official rate of 3 million a year. And in December 1992, the Census Bureau estimated that our population will continue to grow at this rate indefinitely. In 1960, 88% of our people were English-speaking Europeans and Hispanics and Asians were insignificant minorities. In 1993, the whites were 75%, down from 88. Hispanics up to 9%, Asians 3%, blacks 13%. At the existing rates of increase through births and immigration, whites will be a minority here by 2050, with Hispanics reaching 21% and Asians 10%. Now, I would like to add that the demographers, the, the dem demographers, have never, in my knowledge, been correct. <laughs> Ever. Every, every projection that they make in terms of population has been disproven by reality after a period of time. And then, of course, they change their prophecy. Because we are confronted with some other problems which... <clears throat> Economics and statistics do not quite answer. We're faced with the, viral, the spread of viral infections, for instance, for which medicine has no answer. So we can foresee illnesses on a greater scale than before, a la AIDS, which turns out not to be a specific ailment, but a uh, collection of ailments which are then defined by the doctors as AIDS so that they get federal funds in order to treat it and there is no cure. So what the treatment consists of is mainly medical theatrics at this point. We will see more of that. We will also see a great decline as the present generation of elderly people die off because there's been an increasing urbanization around the world. People have poured into cities. There are less children born in cities. I don't know why. Nobody knows why, but that happens to be the fact. We are, as a group, talking about those of us in this room, having less children than our fathers or our grandfathers because of a variety of pressures. One pressure which nobody ever mentions is a lack of faith in the future. You have children when you believe that you're bringing them into a better world. You don't have children when you don't think you're doing that. And this is a subliminal attitude which has an effect upon the body. Without any other precautions being taken, you will automatically have less children. Now, it's impossible to say what's going to happen to the world that we know, the civilization we know, because the Christian civilization in 1900, let's, let's begin with the United States, in 19, we reached the stage 
in 65, where we manufactured one-third of all the manufactured goods in the world. We don't do that anymore. Right now, we're, we're buying the manufactured goods of other countries. So there is not going to be the great explosion of population that we're told about in the newspapers. The newspapers are always about one generation behind the universities when it comes to information. And the universities, as we know, are collective now, so they, they don't tell us everything. But I would estimate that there would be a drop in population in the next couple of generations that those who survive will be stronger than those they replace, that something will have to be done about unlimited immigration into Europe and into the United States. The gates will have to be closed. Otherwise, we will be absolutely drowned out of existence like the Romans were. We would, in other words, we repeated the error that brought down the Greeks and we're repeating the error that brought down the Romans. In the 8th, 19th century, we needed immigrants. In the 20th century, thank you, we've had enough. We have committed the error, the historical and intellectual error, of imitating the ways that our predecessor civilizations fell apart. Now, I agree with everything that I've heard at this meeting in terms of the South because it's the only still existing communal, regional group in the American population today. The North has been inundated with immigrants. The South has been relatively free because there were no jobs down here for a long time. Nobody was encouraged to emigrate to the South. You're just now beginning to get the Cubans into Florida and moving up as far as Atlanta. The banking, I understand that the bank clerks in Atlanta have to speak Spanish as well as English at this point. But many of those will Americanize. I understand that uh, when a couple of uh, campaigns ago, one of the candidates went south and, and spoke in Texas to Mexican audiences in Spanish, they were offended because they're speaking English. Our problem is uh, that we're not getting the upper levels. We got the upper levels from Cuba. We got the merchants and the educated groups from Cuba. But from the rest of Latin America, we're getting the peasants. We're getting the unskilled. We're getting the Indians. And they, they're going to take quite a bit of while to train. In the meantime, the very use of the term white people is a forbidden term. We have endured a revolution that has been unstated. Revolutions, you know, Dan Rather never spoke about a revolution in the United States. Revolutionists of the modern sort never announced their, their efforts until after they succeed. It's after they succeed that you suddenly realize that there's been a revolution because they begin to tell you what you can say and what you can't say. The revolution has been growing here quietly, quietly. First I talked about the dismissal of the clergy from the leadership of our universities. And then the illiberals began to move in and control our press. So they had the universities and the press. And they began to change the language as they had in France before their revolution and as they did in Russia before theirs. So that awfully good words, which we once knew the definitions of, disappeared and had reappeared with new definitions like the wonderful word gay, which now means anything but merriment. And the word liberal, which no longer defines the people who describe themselves so. Illiberal, perhaps, but not liberal. And a host of other words, like the white race, like Christendom, like our 
the religious element in our history ex wiped out of the government schools? How can you describe the rise of the Christian civilization without describing Christianity? It would be like teaching algebra without the X. <laughs> and until we get it back, we are in the position of being counter-revolutionary. We're not introducing anything new. We're trying to restore what we had. Now, to know how we got into this pit, I think, is helpful because we have to devise answers and responses to the people that are now trying to pit us, call us all rebels for saying the white race, for being against immigration for saying that it is not possible for any nation to have a multiple number of religions and ethnic groups who maintain their separate identities all the time. It's not possible for such a society to endure. It will tear itself apart. It will become another India. Spain had three races and three religions for 700 years and it wound up in an explosion and the Spaniards finally drove out the Jews and the Arabs. The Arabs never complained about it. And then proceeded to build the Spanish Empire. Now I'm not saying that we could throw out the people that we had, but I'm saying that if we take any more, we are in danger of drowning. And we cannot afford another great big global war. It will finish off what is left of Christendom. And we have to restore, amongst other things, our language. Tacitus dated the beginning of the Roman end of liberty with the end of free speech. And in order to get back our freedom, we are going to have to begin to say what we think irrespective of those who don't like it. And with that beginning, we can proceed then to take 75% of the country. 75% we still have. It sounds when we listen and when we read and when we watch as though we are the 25% and the others are the 75 but it's not so. We're the 75%. We have in our hands the ability to regain the country. And I, I truly believe with the previous speakers that this is as good a place to start as any. Thank you very much.